Praise God. All right. I'm just going to wait and give a little time for everyone to get on tonight. Praise the Lord. Uh, I'll mention... uh, there's not very many people got on yet, but if they watch later, uh, I just want to remember, uh, remind all of the local brethren that we are having a work day Saturday. I'll try to remember that, to mention this at closing also, but at eight o'clock Saturday morning, uh, we'll have a work day at the church. We're trying to work on our water situation there, so we're going to need several of the brethren there. And uh, Brother Durham, Brother Matthew, I know, and Brother Scott will be there, Brother Painter, um, and I'm sure many of your other brethren are coming also. Um, I appreciate the Lord. I know we're having sort of a spike right now in the, in our, in this pandemic of coronavirus, but you know, we are thankful here in Little Rock that we're um, not being affected uh, in our local church with it. Uh, You know, I know we're not exempt, but we can certainly be thankful. That's for sure. Um, I don't know. um, If you don't put you know, I know my wife is watching and uh, Brother Scott York's watching and, uh, but I don't know if you don't put, if you don't put that you're watching, does it come up anyway that, that, uh, that you're logged in or not? Does somebody know that? If you're on and you can't see, can you see, uh, can y'all see in the comment section if you're on or not or are y'all able to see that or is it just be able to see it somebody let me know about that i want to start the bible study but i was going to give people a little bit of time to get on but um I've got a sort of a allergy, you know, a, like a little bit of a allergy drainage right now. So forgive me for sniffling a little bit. But it just uh, this time of year it just seems like it always happens. I'm not sick or anything. I don't have any. Don't feel bad at all. It's just just something common with me. I have a little bit of sinus trouble and allergies. Like I said, especially this time of year. Um, okay, I wanted, I wanted to talk today on the book of Titus. Um, uh, I'll just start out in the first chapter and first, first verse of the little book of Titus that Paul wrote. Um, just wanting to say a few things about what Paul had to say here, because I feel like, um, I really do feel like that God is dealing, you know, uh, I just had a phone call from Sister Crow in our church. Uh, Most people know her. She's 95 years old. Uh, Okay, Sister Janique, thank you. Um, Sister Tally says she didn't see hers, but Sister Janique says she sees everything, a total number, and 
if anyone's on her friends list also. Um, anyway, getting back to the book of Titus, uh, I, 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 well, first I wanted to mention about Sister Crow. She was, had the question, rather I felt God was in this pandemic and this virus. And of course, uh, she, she doesn't have a means to uh, get on the internet and, and watch our broadcast. So she hasn't heard many things that I've said on the broadcast, but I certainly do. I told her, I certainly believe that God is absolutely in charge of this whole thing. I believe that the Lord uh, is judging this world, but not only is he judging this world, he's judging this body. Peter said, judgment first must begin at the house of God. And so I know God's judging this body. We haven't had a meeting all year. Uh, that's never happened in over a hundred years in our meetings. And, and uh, you know, where the brethren can't really get together. We've had some Zoom meetings, but it's nothing like any of our ministers' meetings or uh, physically getting being able to get together and, and uh, having our general meetings also. And uh, of course, I feel myself that the Lord is dealing with the body about our foundation. I feel like Brother Souders, Brother William Souders laid a foundation, uh, not altogether just the foundation of truth that God began to reveal in Brother Souders' day that I feel like there's many, many truths that has already been laid that came from that era under Brother William Souders. At, uh, he used to teach that, uh, he used to say, you brethren are preaching my message, but the day's going to come that you're going to preach your message. God will take you further. He'll take you beyond where I'm, what he's given us today. And, uh, so he revealed many things back there. In fact, I feel like that there's been foundation teachings that have been either lost or, well, I think to a great extent, they're lost uh, to some people. But um, uh, especially I worry about our younger ministers. Um, because there were many, many, the brethren delved, delved into this word of God in a great way. They spent, you know, 10 day camp meetings, uh, going over, uh, sometimes subjects that lasted for almost the whole uh, time that they were there. And, uh, God would give them answers on some of those things. And for an example, brother Souders is one of his main messages that this body uh, was built on was the message of charity. Of course, the word charity in the uh, 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians, it, it's talking about the love of God. There's a filio love, uh, which is brotherly love, but then there's the agape love, the God, godly love. God's love, that God uh, is working in our hearts. But, and we have to put on charity, even though we may not have it, we still have to clothe ourselves with at least practicing charity. Um, and so, um, you know, that's something that we need to rehearse uh, also, humility. Uh, I feel like God really wants us to be and remain humble uh, to, because God draws nigh to the humble, but he, he, um, he rejects the proud, but draws nigh to the humble. You know, Brother Linegar brought to the body at the campground many years ago, uh, I remember Brother Clyde Patton even asking him a question when he stated it at the campground that God hates pride. 
And um, uh, I remember him being asked, does God not like anything? He, he hates all pride. But Langer said, yes, he hates all pride. <laughs> and uh, I remember God dealing with me in that meeting. And I, I, I don't use the word proud anymore. I never say I'm proud of my children or I'm proud of the, you know, somebody or proud of anything. I just seemed like God just smote my heart. Pride is selfishness. It's self-ego. And um, I, I know that many people don't feel like that we use the word pride today like it was used in, in the Bible, in the Bible days. But uh, Brother Leninger taught us to change that word to being thankful. Instead of saying, I'm proud of my son or proud of my daughter, to say, I'm thankful that my son is doing as well as he's doing or my, my daughter's doing as well as she's doing in that particular uh, era of her life or whatever it is you're talking about. Or I'm, I'm not proud of what God has given me. I'm thankful for what he gave me. Uh, it seems like you're taking the credit yourself in pride where when you're thankful, you're giving honor to God. And it just, you know, it just stuck with me and just smote my heart that I just, I can't use that word anymore. I just, I, you never, you'll never hear me say I'm proud of anything. Um, you know, uh, I just, I just, uh, that just was sealed in my heart. That it just made all kinds of sense to me. And I could just feel in the spirit that, that pleased God for us to be thankful, not be proudful or, you know, have pride about something. So if you haven't got that message, we'll consider what I'm saying. Just try using thankfulness instead of the word proud for a while and see if it doesn't make you feel something and uh, feel an integrity about uh, your worth with God more than your worth with self. Anyway, um, uh, I do feel like God wants us to be humble, a humble people. And um, I know that humility is, is um, a trait that we have got to humble ourselves before God. We're, we're really, uh, we're really nothing without God without his his work in our lives i i don't like to hear people say i'm i'm a nobody you know i'm i'm a uh, i mean I, I think it's okay when maybe god's dealing with you and you really feel um uh, you know real you really realize that without god in my life and touching me i'm i'm just worthless you know the flesh when you when you 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 look at the flesh um, you know, and, but I, I also like to look at the other side that, that I may have been a nobody when I came to God, but his working in my life has made me somebody. I'm God's child. Um, I do have some righteousness in my life that's working in me. I know God's imputed righteousness. I think everyone ought to understand that, that God, you, you're, you may not be perfect. You may not be mature and full, uh, full of the righteousness of God just yet, but God, through the work of Christ, he imputed righteousness and he counts you righteous through your faith, just like he counted Abraham's righteousness. He counted him righteous because of faith. He was justified by faith. Uh, in God's word at that time, in God's promise to him that he would have a, a promised child, a seed of God that the Lord would, uh, it would be the seed of God. Eventually, the Lord's family would come through that promise to Abraham uh, through faith. That was before the law was given. And our faith, we're, he is our father, Abraham's our father, um, 
uh, he was to become the father of many nations. We've always taught that the, uh, he said that his children would be as the stars are in heaven and as the sand is of the sea. We've always taught that the, the stars in heaven would be the bride. Uh, many people don't realize that I was myself, I was brought up in an organization, Pentecostal organization, and I was taught that the bride was the whole church. But when I came to this body of people, I, I, I saw that their teaching helped us to see that the bride would rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years, but the rest of the dead would not live until the thousand years was finished. So for a millennium or a 1,000 year period of time, <clears throat> those that overcome sin, if you read, just read the first letter that John wrote in the second chapter of, of the book of Revelation to the church of Ephesus, when he told them that he had some things against them and he told them that they had fell and, uh, that they had lost their first love. He told them to go back and do their first works over. And then he promised them that those that overcame, the overcomers of that church would rule and reign with him with a rod of iron for a thousand years. They'd rule and reign with Christ. And so uh, the bride is, is just a ruling element. God's government, you might say, down through the thousand years like Isaiah said, the government would be upon the shoulders of Jesus Christ. That, uh, that held the head up. That's what your shoulders do. They, they, they hold the head up by the neck. That's the foundation and, and the leadership. Uh, and, and God's calling us all to leadership. There's a here in this book of Titus that I'm going to talk a little bit on. He gives... Um, uh, Titus uh, instructions to set in order the things that are wanting in, in the church there and in Crete and to ordain elders in every city. Well, uh, and then he gives the qualification for those elders, but saints, those qualifications is for all of us. That's, you know, when God has a leader, there's a qualification to be a leader. But God, God's calling all of us to qualify for the bride of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't you like to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years in a glorified body like the body of Jesus where you're, you're, you can appear, disappear, you, you're well aware of what's going on everywhere in every nation? Uh, Jesus is aware of his children. He can be anywhere at any time. He can zoom in on anybody and pay it, you know, uh, he could pay you a visit. He could uh, watch over you. He may have angels watching over you that, you know, are, are uh, servants of the Lord. You might even call them tattletales. <laughs> you know, Jesus said to his disciples, your angel does behold the face of the father every day. Well, you've got an angel. You've got an angel. If you're one of God's children, there's angels watching over you. And, and sometimes you may feel like, uh, you know, why aren't you helping me? I need help right now. Well, sometimes God wants to, he wants to pull back and see what you're going to do. Uh, God doesn't always want to uh, have to step in. Uh but he wants to see what we'll do under pressure, what we'll do under certain situations. And, uh, but eventually God wants us all to qualify in righteousness. And that's what he wants leaders to be. And of course, overcomers to rule and reign with Christ, to, for God to elevate us to that place. Well, uh, that's one of the reasons let's read here in, um, uh, let me, let me just say a little bit more before I read in Titus about the bride ruling and reigning. Who are they going to rule and reign over? They're not going to reign over 
ungodly people. I mean, there, eventually there'll be judgment brought, but it's going to be through the church. See, one of the things I think needs to be understood is, is that before God makes up the remainder of his bride, part of his bride was made up in the early church and in the uh, days of the New Testament, when Jesus was in, uh, was here on earth in that church, after he resurrected and went back to heaven, he came back on the day of Pentecost in the spirit and he was the head of the church through the Spirit, working through the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, through uh, the minds and hearts of men and women that were born of that Spirit. They were led by his Spirit. That's how he was the head of the church. And, uh, and part of his bride, a, a, a portion of the bride was made up back there in the early church, and then the remainder of the bride will be made up down here in the harvest, in the end of the uh, Gentile world. And uh, I've been talking quite a bit on the coming of the Lord and the harvest of the Gentile world. That's all going to take place um, down here. And so um, uh, uh, God will make up the remainder of his bride that will then rule and reign the thousand years will start. But before that happens, God will graft the Jews back in. See, there would be no one that could, could lead the church that the bride could rule through. You know, look, 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 look at this. The Gentiles, when, when the early church began to fall away and, and if you don't understand the early church fell away, then you, you, you're going to need some help with that because um, you're not going to understand the word of God at all if you don't understand the falling away of the church, of the Gentile church in the New Testament time frame. But when that church fell away, uh, then the, it was given, the gospel was given to the Gentiles, but there was just a small number of Gentiles that was included in that harvest, that Jewish harvest back there, when God grafted the Gentiles. Paul said in the 11th chapter of Romans that they, they were a wild olive branch grafted in. Those original branches were broke, broke off because of their uh, rejection or because of their unbelief. And us being a wild olive branch, olive branch, we were grafted into that olive tree, which is a picture of, of the body of Christ or the church. And uh, those, those that rejected Christ of the Jewish world, uh, they were, uh, they were fixed in a great gulf. That's the, that's the message given in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. The rich man was Israel. Lazarus was the Gentiles. The rich man died and went to hell. And that's talking about a, a, a religious type hell. That's not talking about a literal burning place, but it's talking about a hellish condition that Israel has been in ever since they rejected Christ. And they've been in a great gulf. They, they wanted uh, Lazarus to come and touch their tongue with water, just the spirit of God, just to give them some relief from, from their being without God, their thirst for getting back in a place with God. But um, that's not been able to happen because they wouldn't accept. They still won't accept. There's a, there's a great gulf fixed between the Christian church of the Gentiles and the Jews people today. But God, when he grafts them back in, if you read the 11th chapter of the book of Romans, it tells you that Paul said that uh, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come. Uh, so uh, Hosea showed that after two days, and those are thousand year days, after 2000 years, and that's the end, there's a 2000 year 
Gentile world, just like there was a 2,000 year Jewish world. And at the end of this world, God will graft the Jews back in. When they see him who sighed, they pierce. When they uh, call on him, uh, when they recognize that they missed it, they'll come back in. But look what God's done. He's held them. He has held them in uh, the law of Moses, the history of God, the beginning, uh, Abraham, their father, our father too, but uh, they looked to Abraham as their father, as a as a, uh, God's people, uh, Israel, and uh, uh, then the whole history and all the prophets of Israel. They're still looking for their Messiah. They don't realize that they missed it, but when they see that, there's a picture in the Bible of that where Elijah came down off of Mount Horeb out of the cave and God told him that he wanted him to anoint um, Elijah, I mean, Elisha to take his office. Um, and so, uh, and when he came down off the mantle, hit, I mean, off the Mount Horeb, his mantle, he passed a young man plying with 12 yoke of oxen. That's a picture of the Jew. They're still plowing. They're still working with the 12 tribes of Israel. And, um, but he came by that young man and his mantle, which is his cloak, just happened to touch that young man. That young man dropped his plow and stopped his oxen and took off running after Elijah. And Elijah turned and looked at him and said, what have I, what did I do to you? And he said, I have to follow you. Let me go tell my mom and daddy goodbye. And he went and slew the oxen, burnt the uh, 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 the harness and everything, gave the meat to the to poor and, and went and told his mother goodbye and went and followed Elijah. And that's a picture. That's a picture when the, the mantle of this restored ministry in the end of this Gentile world touches uh, many Jewish people. In fact, this is a telltale mark. Mark it in your mind. When you start seeing full blood Jews come into the body of Christ and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost and see that they're called to the ministry, when you see that, um, you will. that's a sign to you that we're very close to the end. God will graft the Jew back in and he will use them. As a matter of fact, the only people God could use down through the thousand years or the church would fall away again. There wouldn't be anyone that the that the Jesus and his bride could rule the nations through. Uh, it's going to take a ministry here on this earth for a thousand years. But God in his wisdom has held the, the Jews right there in that in the place that they're in in a great gulf that's been fixed but uh, they will come home before this is over with and God will give them this message this mantle will touch them they'll say just like Elisha did they'll say I've got to follow you that's the way it happened to me when I found this body of people I knew I found it I knew I found what my soul was looking for I knew I found the people of God that God was dealing with. It was given a vision and an understanding of what God's going to do. That's one of the things I started out talking about here tonight, talking about um, how that uh, Brother Souders was given a certain amount of foundation teachings, not only of truth, but of righteous living. and. Um, so uh, that's uh, those things we cannot lose. We've got to hold on to what God has gave us, but then we've got to go on and finish the work that God's given us to do. And so <clears throat> the Jew will come back in. They'll receive this message. They'll be just like the apostle Paul. He rejected Jesus Christ being the Messiah. 
And, um, you know, the story about the apostle Paul, how that he, uh, was, uh, res he resisted. Not only did he resist, but he was very active in putting people in prison, uh, uh people in the church because he was against, he was anti-Christ. He was part of an anti-Christ group of people until Jesus knocked him down on the road to Damascus. Remember, he said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. That, that, that little saying right there, you know, uh, what that meant was, I'm, I'm a farm boy, I was raised on the farm, and when you had a, a team of horses or a team of a cattle, oxen, that pulled a plow or pulled a wagon, when you first begin to treat teach them and hook them up to uh, either, you know, we had, we used to have what was called a single tree or a double tree that was behind that, uh, that animal that had harnesses. Uh, uh, um, let me, let me get my, my thoughts going here, right where your reins went to them and they had a harnessing that went over their body and went all the way back and hooked to that single tree, hooked to the wagon or, or plow, whatever they was pulling. If it's a double tree, it'd be two horses pulling. If it's a single, it'd be one horse or one oxen. And uh, But when you first hooked them up to all of this apparatus, they'd try to kick their way out of it. Well, they used to put uh, a, a sharp uh, stick, a prong, in that single tree. And when they'd kick, it, it'd stick them. It would prick their legs and hurt them. And they'd quit kicking because they'd, they'd get hurt. That's what Jesus was telling uh, the apostle Paul. And he said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. He saw them stone Stephen. He, he felt something in that. All along when he was working against Christ, he was feeling uh, the Lord you know, he was feeling the Lord's disfavor with him about all of that. He, there was something God was dealing with him about that it was hard on him, but he was so rooted into the Pharisee movement and their teachings and the influence of being against Christ that he just went the way of his leaders. But finally, God knocked him down. The Lord chose him to be an apostle to the Gentiles and knocked him down. And when God showed him, you remember God blinded him on that uh, day and and sent Agabus to, to heal his eyes. But God did that to show him how blind and how ignorant he was that he couldn't see that the very son of God came to this earth and he rejected. That's how blind he was. But when he saw it, when God opened his eyes and he saw it, he saw Christ in the whole Old Testament. He read it everywhere. He read in all the prophets that it was prophesying of the Messiah and that Jesus was that Messiah. He got that revelation. And he made the statement in the third chapter of Philippians when he said, he said, uh, I'm a Pharisee of Pharisees of the tribe of Je Benjamin. But he said, I count all of that loss that I might win Christ, that I might know him and the power of his resurrection. He got it. He was, it exploded. The whole word of God exploded in his mind. He wrote his epistles right out of the Old Testament teachings, the prophets and the law of God. He saw Jesus and every bit of that. And when the Jew comes back in, they're grafted back in. And they get this message, this mantle of Elijah touches them. It, they, this is going to explode. This message is going to explode in their mind. They're going to get it. And the word of God will not fall away. The church will never fall away again. Uh, those are the people that will get this message and be able to hold it up in a second heaven uh, condition and the bride of Christ and Jesus will be able to rule through that ministry down through the thousand years. And it'll take place, I believe, right here in America to start with, because the body of Christ, the heart of the body is right here. 
but God is reaching out to these other countries. I've got people right here tonight from the Dominican Republic listening to this message. Uh, Brother Brother Jew Lord in, in the uh, Dominican Republic, I see he's on here. Brother, Brother Emilio Green's on here. Uh, Brother Elias Ciprian, I don't know if he's on here yet, but he always generally gets on. If not, he'll listen to this message. Those brethren have got this message, and this message is reaching out to other nations. They're blessed nations because God is adding them in prior to the thousand years, and they'll have an opportunity for the bride of Jesus Christ, just like we have. But the Jews will come in here. And this message will go through the Jews uh, with the help of the bride. And look, in a thousand years, it took us a 2,000 years just to get the bride made up. But in the next thousand years, God's going to clean the whole world up. The, every nation is going to come under the authority of Jesus Christ. Isaiah said in that day, if you died 100 years old, you'd be accursed. Uh, there'll be people that live down through the thousand years, just like Methuselah. They'll live beyond 969 years. In fact, they'll inherit. Those earth dwellers will inherit eternal life and just keep on living. Yes, there'll be a resurrection after the thousand years, but there'll be many people that's already inherited uh, eternal life uh, even before that takes place. So that's going to be something great. I want to be a part of the bride. Wouldn't you like to see what God's going to do for a thousand years and watch this corrupt world change and righteousness personified take place and the Garden of Eden come back into existence? I don't know about Al Gore's uh, climate uh, warming. Uh, I almost believe God's taking us back to a tropical climate and during the thousand years, it'll be just like the Garden of Eden. God will begin to lift the curse off. And uh, before that thousand years is over, it'll be it'll all be the Garden of Eden. That's what we'll live in for a thousand, not only in the end of the thousand years, but throughout eternity, Jesus. And God himself will come down and dwell among us. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to what God's going to do. Uh, and I want to be a part of it. I want to qualify to be a part of it. So I see that Brother uh, brother Fidel from uh, Guatemala is, is on with us tonight. I appreciate Brother Fidel. He's, he's over there by himself. So he's, he's, uh, he's sneaking in on all these Bible studies he can get. And we're glad to have him. We appreciate having him. Okay. In the book of Titus, I wanted to say something about it in the very first chapter and first verse. It says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the acknowledging of the truth, which is after godliness. That word godliness means God-likeness. That has to do with our behavior. It has to do with our conversation. If you look that word up, uh, it, it means holiness, reverence, piety towards God. It's God-likeness, and it has to do with, our, like I said, our conversation. Not so much altogether the words you speak, but did you know that, what's that saying? That uh, 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 actions are are louder than words. Your actions, your behavior, you're speaking something. Every every move you make, everything you do, the way you act in life, your spirit, your attitude towards things, that has to do with your conversation, your behavior, what your life speaks out to others. Uh, and so God wants us to be Godly. It's like I've been talking here lately. I've been trying to get the saints of God to understand that. And I, I'm trying, I want to say this where it can be received properly and in, in understanding what I'm saying. Because what I've been saying is, is that no commandment 
will make you righteous. I'm just going to let that settle in for a second. Keeping a commandment will not make you righteous. It will make you, um, it'll make your actions righteous. But this has got to go beyond commandments. See, God's, God's, God's commandments, God doesn't have to keep a commandment or a law. God, that's his character. He won't steal from anybody. He would never, ever mistreat anyone. He, he wouldn't uh, misspeak or he wouldn't carry a false witness or tell a lie. He, God, that's not God's character is righteous through and through. And for you to keep the commandment, now, now, now hear me on this. The commandments are very important. You first have to learn how to keep commandments. You got to be humble enough to to sanctif live a sanctified life of, of holiness, set apart for God's use. And you'll have to put on charity. You'll have to uh, uh, take these commandments into your life. And what they do is they hold the flesh down. To where God can deal with you. And you'll have to practice these commandments, acting in your behavior of what the commandment tells you to do and not what not to do. But eventually, God wants this to be a part of your character. You got to get beyond commandment. You got to get to, in fact, I believe this I believe you can come to a place to live above sin in your walk with God, and you still won't be perfect. See, Adam, stop, listen to me. Adam lived above sin until he made up his mind to sin. He wasn't deceived. He sinned knowingly, Paul said in the book of Timothy. Uh, he was not deceived. He knew exactly what he was doing. But he lived, he had the power. He had enough knowledge and understanding of truth, of the word of God, to live above sin until he decided and made a, a conscious decision to disobey God and sin, commit a sin. But until then, he had the power to live above sin, but he wasn't perfect. If he'd have been perfect, he couldn't have sinned. So you and I, we, we first are gonna have to get to the place that we can live above sin. You're going to have to get to a place to where you've got enough of the of God in you and enough of the word of God in you that you can hold the flesh down and not allow it to commit a sin. That still won't make you perfect. Don't see, I think men have some men have lost that. But um, so once you get to a place you can live above sin, now you can dwell in the holy place with a sevenfold light, and you can continue as Jesus did, never to give in to sin. And finally, the work of God will be finished in you. So, <clears throat> uh, again, commandments are very necessary, but they will never make you perfect in this sense. They, they, will, they will qualify you for perfection to become a part of your character. Sin will hold the flesh down. I'm sorry, not sin. Commandments will hold sin down or hold the flesh down, the sin nature, until God gets the inner man, the new creature, born of the Holy Ghost, that nature, gets that developed in maturity until the character of God's righteousness has become so much a part of that man, that inner man, that new man, to where the Adamic nature is finally lost. It won't have any mind. Once your mind's fully renewed and matured in the nature of things of God that's become a part of that character, there is no vehicle or mind that the flesh or Adamic nature could operate, and therefore it, 
it ceases to exist. So that's what we're headed for, is that type of perfection. Now, <clears throat> let me go on. Uh, in hope of eternal life, I'm, I'm in verse 2, Titus 1. Which God that cannot lie promised before the world began, but hath in due times manifested his word through preaching, which is committed, he said unto me, that's Apostle Paul, according to the commandments of God our Savior. Uh, then uh, he will we'll skip on down to the second chapter because here he's talking about, uh, you know, that he's asking him to ordain elders in, the, in every church in Crete. Um, uh, in verse 15, chapter one, it says unto all, unto the pure, all things are pure, but unto them that are defiled and unbelieving is no, nothing pure. But even their mind and conscience is defiled. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny, being abominable and disobedient unto every good work and rep and uh, good work reprobate. Reprobate. That's because they they felt like they were Jews and they didn't they didn't believe in Jesus Christ and they looked to the law and the commandments as their saving power. Which I'm telling you, uh, it has to go beyond that. You know, Paul said that the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. And that's where you're at, even when you, even in, in the, in, under grace, you come to Christ, but you've got to have these commandments, the law of God working in you until it begins to become a part of your character. Sooner or later, you ain't going to have, you won't have to have that. Now, I want to go on. Chapter 2 says, But this, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Uh, the reason I wanted to read this because I want you to see what he's, that he's not just talking about teachings of the truth of God's word and revelation and understanding God's purpose and everything. But here's what he wants him, us to get also. That the aged men be sober. Grave, temperate, sound in faith, and in charity, in patience. That word sober, uh, it just means temperate, that you're tempered. You know, you're first, you've got to get knowledge, but that knowledge is going to have to be tempered in you. You know, the way you temper steel is you have to put it through uh, severe heat and then cool it and then, then put it back through severe heat and then cool it. Uh, and finally, and that makes that, that, that makes that steel stronger by going through a, a heating and cooling process. Well, that's what temptation and trials are due to you and I. So you, you may be going through things. I was telling brother Emilio Green just this week, you know, I was telling him he's been through, he's been through a hell. That man's went through a lot of serious uh, things uh, in the last few years, several years. He's went through several things. That's really, it's humbled him. It's uh, took him through some very uh, troublesome times. He's had to trust God. He's been humbled down on his, he's been out on his knees and on his face many times. And he's had to hold on to God almost sometimes by a thread. But do you know that's, that makes you strong. You, you go through the heat, a fiery trial, and you hold on to God through that. Then God will take you through that and then he'll cool you off. He'll, he'll bless you enough. And you go through that cooling process and you'll feel the strength of God that that fire brought in tempering you, teaching you to hold on to God, hold on to the word of God, the things that you've been taught about God. Uh, that Those things, and I'm, just, I'm not just bringing him up, we all have to go through these things. We all have to be tempered. Uh, he said, you know, to be grave. That, that word grave means to be honorable. Uh, and honest, and uh, 
<coughs> of course, he uses the word temper, temperate there. Sound in faith. What and that's talking about sound in the word of God and uh knowing what what uh the truth of the word of God that you've been taught and in charity. See, <clears throat> charity that is uh, uh the love of God and in patience. God God makes us patient through all of this. See, while we're going through all of this process of God dealing in our lives, putting us through trials. God God does put us through trials. And uh, just this nature alone will put us through trials. If you're serving God and living according to his word, you're going to go through trials. But God will even put you through some things. He wants to see how you're going to do. Like I said earlier, he'll he'll get his he'll tell his angels, leave him alone, step back. Let's watch and see what he does. I don't know if the angel goes to him and says he's he's about to give up the ghost. And the Lord says, lay, lay, don't leave him alone. Let's see what he does. And God has a way to pick you back up, even if you fall. Even if you fall down, God can pick you up. He's full of mercy. His mercy endureth forever. Forever, how long it takes. However long it takes for God to be merciful to you, to get you to... to uh, uh, respond to him and and his word and his spirit to work in you, God will be merciful to you. He don't give up like man does. God's not a, he's not a, he's not a failure. If there's a spark, spark of fly, fire, he'll fan it. If there's a broken reed, he'll heal it. He's a God of mercy and God of all patience. Then he says the aged women, likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness. See, that's talking about being a holy woman. That's talking about being uh, a, a set apart woman, not, not taking on the ways of this world, not trying to become like women of the world or be drawing attention uh, to themselves. There's nothing wrong with wanting to, to be well kept and uh, keep your, you know, stay neat and and nice dressed, nice looking, but that that's becoming of a of a, a child of God, man or woman, but women for sure need to need to be holy. They that that becomes holiness, and then not uh, that their behave uh, they're not false accusers. Don't get involved with with uh, you know uh, uh, gossip and murmurs, and, uh, you know, like I said, gossiping. Women, if you're not careful, you you can you can just see one side of a story. Women have a tendency, if they're not careful, men do too, but, but women, you know, they take care of homes. They look at other people's lives, and it's, it's sometimes it's easy to look at just one side of things, but to be charitable, to be patient, to be merciful, uh, to others the way God has been merciful to you. Um, teachers of uh, not given to much wine, teachers of good things, that they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, <clears throat> to be discreet. See, uh, being discreet, to be uh, uh, be able to discriminate what you do, what your life is betraying to others. Uh, 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 not betraying, I'm sorry, but speaking out to others. What uh, to be chaste? That means to be clean and be pure. Um, Keepers of home, good, obedient to their husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. See, uh, these are things that I'm just talking about good, righteous living. That's what Paul called sound doctrine. See, we, 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 if we're not careful, and I understand my ministry is 
dealing with a lot of prophecy and and revealing uh, some of the uh, hidden things, the secret things of the Lord, and making sure that revelation of understanding what God has been doing, what God is doing, what He's going to do. I'm talking about in in not only world events but events in the church. But we cannot leave off these righteous, this sound doctrine of righteous living, of holy lives, uh, that the word of God be not blaspheming. Young men, verse, verse six, likewise exhort to be sober-minded uh, in all things, showing thyself a pattern or an example of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness. <laughs> There's a word uh, that, uh, you know, uh, of, of being pure, not corrupt, gravity, being able to, you know, not let yourself uh, be too uh, outward, you know, to hold yourself steady, to have gravity, you know, don't lose your temper and get uh, all beside yourself over things. Uh, young men, be careful not to be, uh, you know, too boisterous among the elders. Let the elders talk uh, sincerely. To have enough to of sincerity in yourself that uh, you're truly genuine. Uh, your, uh, uh, what would be, uh, you know, that uh, truthful, truthful, sincere, that, uh, you know, understanding this soberness and the sincerity of this message and what God has called us to, to be a good examples to other young men, sound speech that cannot be condemned. You know, one, one of the things Paul said uh, here for uh, qualification for the ministry is that they're blameless. You know, where nobody can point at you and, and tear down, always somebody will, but I'm talking about with actual facts, actual judgmental things. We're to live a life that upholds righteousness, holiness, purity, you know, to be respected and revered that others can get around you and they want what you've got. They say you've got something that they don't find or see in other men. That's what God wants you and I to have that will draw others to the Lord by example. Having no evil thing to say of you. Verse nine, exhort servants to be obedient to their masters. Now, Back in those days, they did have slaves. But this could be easily applied to those of us that work on the job, you know, that our bosses were obedient to our, our overseer, our boss, or your pastor, or, you know, the ministry, to please them well in all things, not answering again, not arguing. You know, some men just loved arguing, you know, <laughs> You know, a, a pastor shouldn't have to explain everything. Uh, in fact, a pastor, most pastors are not going to do everything. It's going to be pleasing to everybody. But neither did my dad. But I knew how to, I knew to respect my dad. And I, I didn't answer, I didn't sass him. Uh, you know, I might would get backhanded if I sassed him. Well, uh, I'll just tell you, saints in Little Rock, I'm never going to backhand anybody. I don't mean that in any way. But, but, you know, I'm just saying to have the kind of respect that we ought to have, you know what that does to a minister? It puts the fear of God in a minister. It should. If it doesn't, he'll disqualify himself sooner or later. But um, anyway, um, not purloining <laughs> that, that word. Uh, that, that mean, what that means is, is to, uh, 
make yourself indifferent from others. Learn how to blend your spirit. Learn how, you know, uh, what is it in Proverbs? Is it the ninth chapter where it says, wisdom has builded her house. She's hewn out her seven pillars. She's killed her beast. She's mingled her wine. There you go. We've learned how to blend our spirits. We've learned how to work with the ministry, work with those that are examples in the church, work in order, flow. If you're in the band, you learn how to listen to the band leader. You don't argue. You learn what the band leader's saying. You, you learn how to be as a unit and how to be in unity to bless the people of God. Our, it doesn't matter whatever. If you're working in the dining room, in the kitchen, you learn how to work in unity and work with those that are in authority and in charge. That's how you become one that's in charge is someone that always works with those that are in charge. Those are people that climb up the, the ladder of responsibility righteously. And so that's what that purloining means. It means to blend your spirit. Don't pull away. Don't be always be on the outside looking in. Get on the inside. Get on the wheel in the middle of the wheel. Did you know that the hub of a wheel on a car is what makes that wheel turn? And the, the, the wheel in the middle of the wheel, get in the hub, the center, the center core of what God's doing. You know, those on the outside realm, they're, they're all apart. But there's a picture there. If you'd get in that, the center, the hub, how God would use you, but showing all good fidelity. Uh, fidelity, that means, um, uh, that's faith, believe, um, truth. Uh, where's that? Where, uh, there you go. Showing all good fidelity being faithful, being uh, one that can be depended upon, that they may adorn the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. That word adorn means to, to wear it, to, to let it be seen. Let that be your covering, uh, you know, to blend your spirit and be faithful in everything. For the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great Savior and our, uh, of the blessed Savior Jesus Christ the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Did you notice there he didn't say anything about the Holy Ghost? See, Paul would always, if that was a third person in the Godhead, he'd always mentioned it. He never does. He always mentions God the Father and Jesus. That's because there is two in the Godhead. The Holy Ghost is the Spirit of God the Father. That is his presence. That's who he is the spirit of his spirit that was in Jesus Christ that's in us. Somebody asked me one time, how many's in the Godhead? I said, I'm trying to get in it myself. I'm born of the spirit of God, the, the father, the son, and the Holy Ghost was in them and it's in me. And I'm a son of God myself. <laughs> Hallelujah. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto us himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So <clears throat> I'm just showing you that uh, what he called sound doctrine here was just holy, righteous living. Yes, it comes. It comes from this teaching that we have, but we want to 
we will, look, did you know you can have, you, you can dress like a holy Pentecostal and you can have a spirit as rotten as, as rotten can be. You have a sorry spirit, but you, you know, and that's what a lot of people, I found out, I found out a lot of people equate their righteousness by dress standards, by uh, keeping certain commandments of what they won't do. You know, there's some people that they're so holy that, you know, what's that saying? They're so heavenly uh, minded that they're no earthly good. <laughs> well, there's a certain amount of truth to that. You know, we, we want to be an example to all people. We want to have God's righteousness. We want to be adorned with it. We want to have mercy. We want to be kind. We want to be gentle. Look what wisdom from above is first pure. See, our motives got to be pure. We can't hate people. We got to love people. We got to love our enemies. Jesus taught that. Um, let's read a little bit in the third chapter. Put, up, put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work, to speak evil of no man, to be no brawlers. See, don't get in fights. Don't enjoy arguing and fighting and murmuring and complaining, but be gentle, showing all meekness to all men. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers lust and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But after that, the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness, which we've done, but according to his mercy, he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. When he went back to heaven, when he went back to heaven, he sent the Holy Ghost back to us. He ruled the church. He was the rider of the white horse through the spirit of God, the righteousness of God that was in the spirit, that being justified by grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. He says, but avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law for they're unprofitable and vain. A man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, admonition reject, knowing that he is such is subverted. He is that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. So he's just saying men that want to argue and men that want to work wrong and men that won't work uh, faithfully and with reverence to the order of God after the second or third admonition, admonition reject them. So uh, God can't save everybody, saints. I hate to tell you that. But we're to have at least the first, the second, and even the third admonition before we quit digging around the trees. Remember Jesus gave the little parable about, you know, he wanted to, he had a, the tree, wouldn't bring forth any fruit. And uh, they wanted to cut it down. He said, no, let's dig around it one more year. Let's see. That's the mercy of God. Thank God he dug around me for a few uh, period of time that he finally was able to cause me to bear some fruit. God helped me to keep bearing fruit, to be fruitful unto my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Well, God bless your hearts. It's, 
you know, an hour goes by awful quick on on that sometimes. And some of these, uh, I felt the Lord tonight from what I was saying. And so hope it blessed some of you. Uh, I love all of you. I love the people of God. I love the work of God. And I will tell you this, we'll get beyond this pandemic and we'll move on. But I will tell you, there will be many, many things that God's going to do that is going to bring judgment to this world and judgment first must begin at the house of God. God is judging us. We need to take this time and allow it to humble us. Let's all humble down before the Lord. Let's recognize our need of him and let's live these principles that he was, Paul was describing to Titus here in this little uh, epistle that he wrote. Help us, oh God, to get these things working in our lives. Let's get back on the foundation that God gave Brother Souders and the men of those days, of the early days of this body, to be charitable, to be humble, to never look on ourselves as being high and mighty, but to always be careful. Remember, Paul said, be careful for nothing. It may seem like nothing, but be careful that you don't let something get by you that the Lord uh, wanted you to be careful with or be careful for. Oh God, help us, Lord Jesus. Lord, we need your light, like your leading and your guiding. God, we need your strength today. God, touch your people. Touch this body and this ministry and help us, oh God, to serve you, to live for you. Oh, God, for these righteous good things to abound in our lives. Help us to be adorned with the goodness of your righteousness, Lord. Keep working in our lives. God, work in our churches. Work among our people. Help us. God, those that need touched here tonight, Jesus, they're sick in their bodies. Those that have this COVID-19 virus in this body, touch them, oh, God those of our families and those that we're acquainted with that we know of, God, we just ask you to reach out and touch them. Use these things to draw people to you, Lord. Help us to be righteous, faithful, and examples that you could draw through our vessels. You could draw men unto you. Oh God, we pray. Jesus, touch our people, touch our assembly here in Little Rock. And in the body of Jesus Christ, touch Brother Williams, Brother Steve Suttmiller, uh, those in Brother in Wichita, Brother Gary Green, touch his mother. Oh God, touch the work in the Dominican Republic, Lord, and in Haiti, Brother Hugo Rodriguez, and and Brownsville, and Mexico, Brother Memo Cano, and the works of Brother Johnny Bud. God, touch those people. Oh, God, we need your help tonight, Lord. We call on you to help us, Lord, to serve you and do your will. Hey, man, in Jesus' name, I love all of you good people. You brethren, I'll see you Sunday, uh, Saturday morning for our work day at the church. I know you, many of you will be there and be faithful. I appreciate you so much. And the rest of you, I'll see you in church Sunday morning, Bible study. Um, Continental breakfast at 9.30 in the dining room. Bible study at 10, church at 11.30. So see you all then. God bless your hearts and have a good night.